So if you guys don't mind, I've got a one o'clock, or I got to get down to Fayetteville as close to one o'clock as I can. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started today. Uh, first and foremost, I'd just like to thank you all for uh, taking time out of your day to uh, come spend a few minutes with me and give me an opportunity to tell you about uh, myself, the Rockford Police Department, and uh, what's going on in, in your community. Uh, and second, I'd, I'd like to thank the, uh, Judy and the, the library staff for, uh, for the idea. This is a great opportunity. Uh, you know, with everything going on in, in our country today, uh, in terms of community and uh, law enforcement relationships, any time a, a chief of police has an opportunity to get in front of any community group uh, is really a great uh, opportunity. So Judy, thank you and, and your staff. I really do appreciate thank it. Thank you. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm not a, a brand new chief, but I'm new. Um, I was sworn in uh, as the uh, Rogers Police Chief on February 27th of this year, and that was following uh, the passing of a, uh, a wonderful community servant, James Allen. Um, he's, uh, he was a figurehead in law enforcement in Northwest Arkansas for 26 years. Uh, my dad worked for him at the Bentonville Police Department. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to also get to work for him uh, up until uh, his untimely uh, death of cancer. It was, a, it was a tough time for our uh, agency, uh, but it was a, a learning experience for us. Um, he did a great uh, job of telling us and showing us uh, what it's like to deal with adversity. Uh, I think that's a lasting legacy that, uh, that he left me personally in our department as a whole. So, um, I am uh, a 21 year veteran of the Rogers Police Department. I've, uh, I've worked in just about every uh, slot imaginable uh, on the enforcement side uh, there at the police department. I started like uh, everyone else in February of 1994 uh, going to the police academy uh, down in Camden where I spent eight beautiful weeks in that part of the, uh, the state. Uh, freezing to death, running and, and uh, learning, and uh, doing what we what we do down there. Uh, following, you know, academy, you go. Every one of our officers, uh, you know, all the way back to you know early '90s up until today, uh, they go through a uh, a 12 week field training program. Um, I did the same, and it's basically some on the job training where you ride with a uh, a senior training officer, and you find out the ins and outs of the job, how it's really done. Um, so following that, I did about uh, I did about a year and a half in patrol. Uh, in uh, January of 1996, I became a detective, uh, and the detective division uh, was where I spent the majority of my career uh, throughout climbing up the ranks. It was something I really enjoyed. I kind of felt like you were uh, uh, able to exercise your brain a little bit more um, and, and have a, a a little bigger challenge to deal with in terms of the types of cases that you work, um, who you interact with, things like that. Um, so I did that for a number of years. I was promoted uh, a couple different times. Um, things really got interesting in 2006 when I got uh, promoted to lieutenant. It was a really uh, a big eye opener for me. Uh, lieutenant for us is kind of a middle management rank, and uh, uh, it really drove home the point that uh, I could personally have an impact on what goes on at the Rogers Police Department. Uh, so I began to kind of shape my future at that point, uh, thinking maybe someday I'd like to be the chief of police, but not really taking any affirmative steps to, uh, to make that a realistic goal of mine. Um, a lot of things happened to me that I, um, I just account the timing, um, just being in the right place at the right time. In, uh, in terms of promotion, because in uh, January of 2011, um, uh, a, a very young captain retired from the Rogers Police Department, and uh, and I was able to, to secure promotion to captain at that time. And then Chief Allen, uh, he came in in April of 2011, and and here we are, uh, five years later, uh, I'm the chief of police. So um, that was a little bit about my career. Um, I've been a Benton County resident since 1985. Um, I said it earlier, but my, uh, my dad was a Bentonville police officer. Um, we came from the great state of Minnesota to escape the winters uh, to Arkansas. And uh, we spent a little bit of time in uh, central Arkansas where uh, his uh, mother and father were farmers down there. 
Uh, we went and lived in Conway for a few years before settling here in, uh, in God's country. Um, you know, we've been a lot of places across the United States, and it's kind of hard to beat. Northwest Arkansas. Uh, there's some great places out there, but there's nothing like coming home. So uh, I'm a graduate of Benville High School, as is my wife, 22 years. Um, I have three lovely children, um, a fifth year senior at the University of Arkansas, a freshman at the University of Arkansas, and then a uh, junior at Benville High School. So um, they don't allow moonlighting as a police chief, but now would be a really good time for me to change that law too at the University of Arkansas. So, uh, but they're they're both doing great, um, and and really uh, proud of all of them. Uh, my wife is a uh, lifelong Arkansan. Uh, we met in high school. Uh, here we are, 22 years, three kids, a bunch of dogs, and a few houses later. Um, she's a business owner in Bentonville, um, in the real estate community kind of services all of Northwest Arkansas. Uh, so we have, a, we have a lot of deep roots in Benton County, Rogers and Bentonville in particular. Um, very passionate about uh, our community, um, having served here for 21 years. Um, so again, it's, it's very important to me uh, to have an opportunity to come out and, and visit with uh, members of our community. I don't do it often enough, I'll admit. Uh, life gets in the way. And, um, you know, this report's due or that report's due or it's budget season now. So. Uh, there's always something to do, but uh, I want to just take some time to tell you about the Rogers Police Department. There's a lot of things that go on at the police department that you never read about in the newspaper, uh, you never see it on the TV, and it's the little things that to me kind of make it interesting. It's the makeup of who we are, what we do uh, every day. So start with the basics. How many police officers do we have? Well, we have 103 uh, allotted positions. Uh, we currently have 100 sworn police officers. Um, to put that into a little bit of perspective, when I joined in 1994, we had about 65 police officers. So we've grown that much over 21 years, and that's just keeping up with the population growth. Um, you know, estimates, I've, I've seen them all over the map, but I think the latest estimate of population in Rogers that I've seen, I think, comes from the council, the Northwest Arkansas Council, uh, and they put us a little over 60,000. The pie in the sky figure for determining the appropriate amount of officers uh, for a community is uh, two officers per 1,000 residents. So if you follow that, which it's not scientific by any stretch of the imagination, uh, we're a little short. Uh, but in in reality, you know, for me to go to our city council and justify additional expense of a police officer and all the equipment training that goes along with it, I've really got to show uh, you know some crime figures or calls for service and things like that. Um, so we're, we're good. Um, at the 103, uh, we're well staffed uh, for our call load. Um, I'll kind of share some figures uh, later about that. Um, but within that 100, we're broken down into three different divisions. And the first, and, and the most obvious that everybody sees in our community, is uh, the Uniform Operation Division. And that encompasses anybody, pretty much anybody that wears the blue uniform of the Rogers Police Department. The majority of those officers work in our patrol division. And if you uh, call 911, that's, those are going to be the, the ladies and gentlemen. They're going to show up to uh, take, take care of whatever you need help with. Um, we have a traffic unit. Their primary responsibility is the investigation of traffic accidents and the reduction of traffic accidents through selective enforcement and things of that nature. Um, we've got about uh, five or six guys that, uh, that that's all they do is they work traffic. Um, we have a pretty a uh, good sized school resource unit. Uh, we've got six police officers uh, assigned to both of the Rogers High Schools and then all four of the uh, junior high schools in the, in the city. And uh, they are a great uh, pipeline into that generation for us. They uh, really have a pulse of what's going on in the schools. And, and as you know, um, Northwest Arkansas is not immune to, to the violence involving juveniles. So we, uh, we rely a lot on our school resource officers to be able to get into those schools and develop relationships and help us uh, keep uh, at least tabs on, on what's going on in the schools and with our youth in the, in the community. Um, also within our Uniformed Operations Division, we actually have a SWAT team. Um, it's a part-time SWAT team. Um, and they, they only get activated on uh, high-risk incidents. Uh, Routine, not, not I mean, I'm going to use the word routinely. Um, 
they're most often used for uh, the service of high-risk drug search warrants, uh, looking for narcotics. Um, and they get called out probably 10 to 15 times a year. Um, it's pretty rare that uh, our SWAT team gets called out for anything like you would probably see on TV when it comes to like the barricaded subjects or the hostage rescues or anything like that. They're, they, uh, they, they serve a lot of search warrants though. That's, that's the kind of bread and butter of that team. Uh, and we also have a bike patrol, and that's something that uh, we've really invested a lot in uh, over the last several years with the development of the trail system throughout the city. Um, it's my belief that, uh, you know, that's a, as a city uh, function, those trails uh, that are throughout the city, throughout Northwest Arkansas, I kind of feel like we're the responsible party to provide security out there, and the cars don't fit down there. And I would think uh, Barney Hayes would get really upset if I, one of my police Tahoes was cruising up and down his brand new trail. So um, we, uh, we have a couple different methods by which we patrol out there. Uh, predominantly it's our bike officers, but we also have some specialized vehicles, uh, uh, ATVs uh, that we can use out there, as well as uh, good old fashioned golf carts that we use. So uh, being out there, being visible has kept our trail system very, very safe. Um, there's not a trail in the city that uh, I would tell my wife to avoid, uh, my kids to avoid. Um, they've done a fantastic job uh, making them just a great part of our community. And, and I want the community to know that we're going to do everything we can to, to keep those trails safe and crime free. So and that, and that, that's the uniform operation vision. That's the bulk of, of where we're at. Probably about 70% of all of our sworn officers work uh, in that division. The, uh, the second division that we have is the uh, the Criminal Investigation Division, so that's the detectives, and those are broken down into three distinct units within the uh, division. We have a, a narcotics unit, and they, that's what they do. They go out looking for drugs. Um, they're a plainclothes uh, assignment. Some of them are undercover. They grow the beards and the long hair and everything like that. Um, if you'd look at it, you would be shocked, uh, a couple of them, to realize that, that they're actually police officers. They, they fit in very well uh, in, in, with the criminal elements. So, um, the uh, Crimes Against Persons Unit, um, they investigate any crime involving injury or assault to another person. Uh, they stay extremely busy with uh, child sex crimes. Um, they, those cases are uh, extremely intense to work. Um, I'm not going to say we have just an absolute ton of them, but they are very, very time consuming take a lot of constraints to do everything we can to protect the child during those investigations. And that's uh, the main reason why they're so uh, labor and manpower intensive. Uh, but they would investigate uh, any shootings, stabbings, homicides, anything like that as well, that group of individuals would. And then the third unit uh, that's within our detective division is uh, the crimes against property unit. So if you uh, forgot to lock your car uh, and went out the next morning and uh, your change cup was stolen. That's considered a breaking and entering. Uh, you're a victim, but you haven't received a personal injury, so that would go to our crimes against property unit. Uh, we have about four or five in each one of those uh, different units, and then each one of those units has a sergeant, and they're in charge uh, of that unit. So uh, I recently changed uh, to balance our workload between the three captains. Uh, each division is headed by a captain. Um, excuse me. I uh, changed uh, a little bit of the workload, and I've also moved our training division um, and our evidence unit underneath our CID captain. So he, uh, he's, he's got to work a little harder now than he has over the last couple of years. And uh, our, our third and final unit uh, at the police department is what we call support services. So every other function that is undertaken by any city police department um, falls in his lap. Um, and that encompasses everything from uh, our dispatch center, our records unit, to our maintenance staff, to uh, the, the care and uptake of our fleet. Uh, we've got about 110 vehicles that he's responsible for. Um, the maintenance of our building and grounds. Um, and I think I can keep going that guy. He's a really busy guy. He, he works very hard. Uh, but in, and within that, there's very few sworn police officers in that, unit, in that division, 
but there's about 45 uh, civilian employees, and uh, they work in everything from the maintenance to our records uh, to dispatch. Uh, we've got a very large dispatch center uh, there that's housed at the police department. Um, I'd encourage you if, you, if you're interested, I'd love some business cards over there to give me a call or, uh, or send me an email sometime if you want a tour of our facility because that, I kind of refer to that room that they're in as the nerve center to the city. Um, any kind of problem that's going to go on day or night within the city of Rogers, is, it's going to all funnel to that room right there. So we have some very, very capable uh, individuals in there who are great at multitasking because when you sit in their chair, it's just absolutely amazing to me. Um, you sit down and you've got four keyboards in front of you, all hooked up to four different computers, and they've got six, no, they've got eight computer monitors in a huge bank in front of them. And we have six of those stations uh, in our entire dispatch center. And at every station um, that they are cross-trained, they can do multiple functions from each one of those stations. Um, the 911 phone rings, any one of them in the room can pick it up. They can talk to police, they can talk to fire, and they can also talk to other agencies as well. And like we sometimes, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, someone from a cellular phone will be right on the edge of the city limits and the 911 call will ring to us and we'll have to transfer it to Bentonville or Benton County, um, Pea Ridge, you know, some of the boarding agencies uh, for their response. So that's an extremely uh, busy room. It's very technical. Um, they have a lot of great technology in there. Um, their, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of this. It was, well, I think the old TV show was called Rescue. You may remember that. Yeah, so Rescue. And it was like almost like a computer voice that dispatched them. You know, they get right, rah, 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 and the doors would open, and then they, somebody would be talking. Well, that's real. Uh, that's one of the things that we just started um, a few years ago, and it's called uh, Locution, is the name of this program. So what happens is, um, if, if you call 911 for a medical or fire emergency, um, our dispatchers there at the police department enter this into a computer system that automatically, by the address, will uh, select the fire station that's going to get toned out. It'll open the doors, turn the lights on, and give them a computerized dispatch of the type of call and the location. And Tom Jenkins, who's a very good friend of mine over at the fire department, um, you know, his big thing is 60 seconds from the time the fire call is dispatched, he wants firefighters in trucks pulling out of the station. So he did this, we did this locution program as a way for him to cut down his response time. So if you think about that, from the time that dispatcher hits that button, 60 seconds later, trucks are rolling out of fire departments across the city. Uh, and respond to whatever emergency it may be. So um, if you haven't had Tom Jenkins here yet, he's, he's a lot more entertaining than me. Um, he's not as good looking as me, but. Uh, now Tom, Tom and I go on great. Um, I was able to make fun of him in front of the mayor today, so that was a bonus for me. Um, but we've got a great fire department and a great relationship with our fire department, uh, and that's not something that you just routinely see. Uh, emergency services, um, working together just makes us a strong community as a whole for the city. Uh, a little bit more about us. Um, we do enjoy very, uh, very, very good support from our mayor and our council, and I'd like to thank our residents as well. Uh, you know, we had a great uh, 2011 bond issue across the board in the whole entire city. We were well supported in the police department's request. Um, annually, we get a great budget. Um, I never go and ask for something I don't need. Um, I don't put a lot of fluff in our budget, um, but it's still a very big budget. Um, we're about $11.3 million for our budget in uh, 2015, but about 85% of that is human resources costs. That's, uh, that's all of our payroll, that's our overtime, that's uh, our insurance, things like that. Um, and that, that's a huge number. And, but when you think about 150 employees, uh, some of whom have been there, you know, two decades or more, um, that they, we, we get expensive. Um, this past year, we had 3% of our budget was uh, capital improvement. Um, that's going to be fleet. 
Um, every year, um, we spend a lot of money on cars. Um, we figure that uh, those Tahoes that we're buying today, um, they're a little bit more expensive. Um, they're about $2,000 more per unit than Ford's uh, offering in the, in the police cars, but they're big and we cram those things full of equipment. Um, I told someone the other day that when you sit down in a modern day police car, it's almost like climbing in the cockpit of a jet fighter. Um, there's just a ton of equipment in there, uh, and we add more every year. Um, so having that big platform is really, uh, really important to the officers. That's their office. You know, they spend eight hours a day there. Um, a comfortable police officer is gonna be a happy police officer. And um, I think, uh, a much better representative of our community when they do show up to deal uh, with the citizens that need us. So, um, but the the, uh, uh, the equipment that goes in there um, is is really astounding. Um, that every one of our cars, our patrol fleet has onboard cameras. Uh, the police officers wear uh, the the microphone on their belt. So what happens anytime they turn the blue lights on, um, whether they're responding to an emergency situation or they're just conducting a traffic stop, um, the recorder goes on automatically. Um, so, uh, and it captures 30 seconds prior to them actually flipping the switch. And that's kind of built in for us if there was a crash, because they have crash sensors in them too. So we got 30 seconds. So anytime one of our cars crashes, we got it on video, unfortunately. And it doesn't always play out well for our officers because you know sometimes we screw up. But um, So we've got the, the video systems in there. Um, They've got a full-blown laptop computer uh, that's in there that they do a lot of communicating with dispatch on. Uh, they receive a lot of their non-priority calls for service over the computer <coughs> these days. Uh, they get a tone on their computer, they get pulled over, they stop and they look, and then they just hit a button on the computer screen, which then tells our dispatchers back at headquarters that um, the dispatch has been received and I'm on my way. And then when they check on scene, instead of the old days like I did, where you're picking up a radio and talking over the air, they're hitting a button on a computer screen, letting the dispatchers know that they're at their location where they're needed. So, and that's just on the non-priority uh, calls, or the low-priority calls, I guess. But then, they, you know, you've got the, um, the light bars, the sirens, and everything like that. Uh, there's a couple of uh, long guns uh, that each officer carries. Uh, they're pretty well equipped uh, for that. And, uh, one of those is a less lethal shotgun, and, and I'll get into it here in a little bit, but you've heard, I'm sure, on the news that uh, some uh, police uh, officers across the country have you know, made some bad decisions or, or found themselves in situations where uh, they're now on the other end of the, uh, the jail cell. Instead of on the outside, they're on the inside. Uh, so I think it's incumbent upon me as a chief to give them absolutely every tool I can so they have all of these items at their disposal to handle the hundreds and hundreds of different situations that we face. And one of those is our less lethal tools. You, you know, I'll go back to, to uh, the Ferguson, Missouri, which is kind of the, the seminal moment that kicked all this off. Uh, you know, that officer did not have a taser. He did not have access to a less lethal shotgun. Uh, I think he had a baton and then he had a firearm. So he was going from hand to hand, I mean, his options were hand to hand combat, basically, straight to lethal force. Well, what you know, my philosophy is, is that we want to do everything possible to make sure that we give our officers plenty of choices before they ever have to resort to using lethal force. So that's why in every single one of our patrol vehicles, there's a shotgun in there with an orange stock on it. So there's no mistaking what it is. And it's what we call a less lethal shotgun. The Rogers Police Department got rid of every single live shotgun shell that we had. We used to carry uh, buckshot and slugs in, in our cars whenever uh, I was younger and up until a few years ago. And now we have a, a specialized round that looks exactly like a 12 gauge round, but it shoots out a bean bag basically. It's just a, uh, it's a cloth sack, for lack of a better word with a stabilizing tail on it, and inside of that, uh, that cloth is bismuth, and it's malleable, um, you can squish it around, but it will not penetrate the body if used correctly. Now, there's, there's been accidents out there with it, but it's a pain compliance tool, and it's a standoff tool, and where if we've got somebody um, that happened the other day, um, showed up at a local church, um, he was having a mental episode, um, he started threatening suicide. So 
the last thing we want to do is help him kill himself. Um, so, we, you know, our officers are there trying to talk him down. Uh, but one of the options that they have in those situations are these 12 gauge less lethal shotguns because, you know, you can shoot them in the leg. Um, we don't we don't test them on each other, but from everything I've seen, it would really, really hurt. Um, and it's a pain compliance tool. Um, and that's kind of the ugly side of law enforcement, but, you know, that's the way that we hope to give our officers the tools that they need to uh, to keep people alive and, and also not find ourselves in the headlines of the CNN. So, um, uh, and one last little thing about us um, before I get into uh, some, some numbers um, is that we are CALEA accredited. And we're one of about 10 police agencies in the entire state that have this accreditation. And CALEA is the Commission for Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies. And what CALEA did years ago was they got together several uh, large executive law enforcement organizations from around the country and they developed a set of standards. If we could build a perfect police department from the ground up, what would the standards look like? And they put these out, and you can join this program, and you can subject yourself to these standards. Well, we started this project in about 2009, and it involved uh, an entire revamp of our policy manual. It involved uh, a bunch of reworking how we actually handle business throughout the city. Um, and it involved outsiders coming in and reviewing everything that we did. They looked at our policies, they looked at our practices, we offered them proofs of what we did, and in 2010, we received our first CALEA accreditation. Um, it was a milestone moment for the police department. Um, in 2013, uh, we got our second, or our first reaccreditation, meaning that uh, three years later, we were still meeting the standards that uh, CALEA has in place. And next year, we'll go for uh, reaccreditation number two, um, where we'll, again, we'll have on-site inspectors come in and they spend about a week and they, the house is open. They can look through pretty much anything that they want. Um, you'll have, the community has a, a, an opportunity to come and visit with them and say either good things about us or bad things about us things that you like or that you don't like. Community input is part of the clear process. Um, so we're very happy for that. And a little bit of trivia for you. Um, Rogers is the only city in the entire state that has an accredited law enforcement agency, an accredited fire agency, and an accredited EMS service. So that puts us in pretty elite company. Um, you know, I'll, I'll credit Tom Jenkins with a lot of the work, but uh, you know, we, we've done some good things there at the police department too to make sure that the structure is there for us to provide quality professional service to you, the taxpayers, and the citizens who, who deserve it and need it. Um, so a lot of times I, when I talk about uh, what's going on in the city, a lot of people want to know what crime looks like in the city. And I've got, I'm just going to throw out a few numbers here for you. Um, so in 2014, uh, obviously the latest year that we have full figures for, um, we had 8,210 offenses reported to the Rogers Police Department. Um, that sounds like a lot, but um, you gotta understand how we do our figuring. Um, every time somebody breaks into a car and steals an item out of there, there's, that's two offenses. That's the breaking and entering of the car and then the theft of whatever item that came out of there. So most offenses that are reported to us have two offenses combined, and then some have, will have even more, depending on if there's like an assault and battery and a burglary. Somebody breaks into the, the next girlfriend's house and slaps it around a little bit. So you've got burglary, assault, and potentially battery there as well. So um, while that 8,210 figure sounds pretty astronomical when you figure there's 60,000 residents in the city, 80% uh, of those crimes were crimes against property, meaning that it was a theft, it was a breaking or entering, it was a burglary. And it, not to discount them and say that they're bad, that they're no big deal, they certainly are. Um, but as a police chief, I'm very glad that the majority of our crime is false property crime and not people getting hurt out on the street. Um, the majority of our um, crimes against persons that we investigate are domestic disputes. Um, so far this year, We've investigated 340 domestic abuses uh, that occur uh, in the city limits. 
Um, I'm on the board of directors uh, for the North of Arkansas Women's Shelter, and, and we see a couple years ago we started seeing these spikes in these numbers for some reason. So uh, one of the things we did in response was uh, we took one officer off the street and designated him as a domestic violence coordinator. And his name is John Harmon. He's a great young man. He's extremely smart. He's very compassionate. Um, he reaches out to every single domestic violence victim in the city of Rogers the day after they've dealt with us and make sure that they know about the women's shelter, or they know about counseling services, they know about orders of protection, they know their options. And then, we, then he does a good job of trying to keep up with them too. Because a lot of times what happens is by the time uh, we get to court, you know, six, eight months down the road, We've lost touch with the victim, they moved away, and they haven't kept up with us. So the, the bad guy gets off scot free because we can't find the victim to get into court. So um, we've seen some big improvements in that. Um, unfortunately, those numbers keep going up. Um, to see, I just pulled that number this morning 340 uh, since January 1. Um, that is going to probably turn out to be a very significant increase over the last two years' numbers. But the other big um, the big things that we uh, look at, uh, thefts, and that could be anything from the theft of a bicycle off of the front porch to the theft of a trailer or the theft of a car. We've had 377 thefts reported so far this year. Uh, our next biggest crime category, shoplifting, 342. Uh, Walmart keeps us busy. They have full-time employees at Walmart who do nothing but look for shoplifters, and we're there a lot. Um, we, they do a good job and they give us good cases, and and we're, we're able to work a lot of them. Um, the breaking and entering is 252 so far this year, and that's the cars. And I don't know this, but I will tell you, in my experience, at least 90% of all car break-ins are because somebody forgot to lock their door. And it's just a crime of opportunity. What we're seeing is uh, juvenile kids, good kids, they're doing good in school, they live in nice neighborhoods, they have a great family life, they're out late at night, it's summertime, they're bored, and they do what they call car hopping. And they'll just walk through neighborhoods lifting car handles, and when they find one, in they go. They may take your change cup, they may take your car charger, they may not take anything. There might be a pair of sunglasses. So if you take anything away from today, when you get home tonight, lock your car door. And I hope it's locked out the parking lot right now. <laughs> um, so we have, uh, okay, that was B&E, uh, 157 burglaries. I looked at that, that was 117 residential burglaries and uh, 40 uh, what we call commercial burglaries uh, where a business is broken into. Those numbers are uh, actually down this year, uh, which is very good. So where's all our time go? Motor vehicle crashes. 1,496 so far this year, and that's a bunch. That does not include the 547 that have occurred on private property so far this year, because we respond to private property accidents, but we don't take reports on them. So almost well over 2,000 uh, car collisions so far, and we've got, what, three and a half months left to go. <laughs> so what about, the, what about the big stuff? What about the shootings and stabbings and all this stuff? Okay, for 2015 year to date, we have had one murder, but it was also a murder-suicide. It just happened a few weeks ago. Uh, it was a domestic violence situation involving uh, drugs, and a gentleman took the life of his uh, intimate partner and then took his own life. Um, we've had four shootings so far, four shooting investigations this year, and five stabbing investigations this year. So, okay, Chief, you've had 10 violent crimes so far this year. You know, why are, you know, what are you doing? This seems out of control, the crimes are in. Well, the difference in the types of stabbings and shootings that we see here versus a big city is pretty much everybody that did the shooting knew who they were shooting at. And the person who was getting shot at, they knew who was shooting at them because of a prior fight, prior disturbance, something like that. Same with stabs. A lot of domestic stuff, a lot of known uh, uh, known crime, we call it. There is very, very little uh, violent crime, can, you know, random violent crime uh, that is done in the city of Rogers against, you know, by someone just targeting a random individual. It just does not happen. I, knock on wood, let's hope it never does get that way. But that is a very comforting figure to me 
to know that the majority of our uh, violent crime is perpetrated by people that are already on our radar. We're dealing with them, um, and they know who is doing. It. You know, the victims usually know. Um, a lot of the problems we have with solving these crimes are getting people to cooperate with us because they want to go out and handle it themselves. They want to fix it themselves. So, um, so last year, with all that crime, eight thousand two hundred uh, and ten offenses. Um, how did we do as far as clearing those cases and making the arrest? Well, for uh, 2014, uh, our property crime clearance rate, meaning we solved 40.3% of all crimes against property that were reported to the Rogers Police Department. The national average amongst all law enforcement agencies who report to the FBI is 18.6%. So we blew that out of the water. Persons crimes, we cleared 82.2% of all persons crimes versus the national average of 47.7%. So our officers are doing a great job of following up because it's very easy for those guys, especially our evening shift, when they have call after call after call to get behind on their cases, to get behind on their reports. Um, th those numbers show me that we have good structure in place to make sure that we're taking care of our crime victims because that's who we really need to be focused on is the people who are being victimized in our communities. And I think our officers do a great job. We got the numbers approved. So, um, what about tickets? Well, um, we write a lot of tickets. Um, the last year we wrote 5,000, and that seems like an awful lot of tickets until you take into account that we had 14,000 enforcement contacts. That's either checking a pedestrian, checking a parked vehicle, or pulling over a vehicle. So out of 14,000 possible enforcement contacts, we only wrote 5,000 tickets. That's a whole lot of warnings, and that's something that I'm, I'm happy with, to be honest with you. I do not push tickets. I do not want to see the Rogers Police Department become a revenue generator for the city. That's not what we're here for. Uh, I want to see contacts. I want to see our officers out there on the side of the road having a respectful conversation with the motorists about what they did wrong. Now, if they want to write a ticket, that's completely up to them. That's their discretion. They have that. That's in the law of Arkansas. That's in our policy. It's completely up to them. They'll never hear the chief of police standing over their shoulder going, I think you need to write a ticket on that. Um, that doesn't work. You know, there is no such thing as quotas. Um, I get asked that every once in a while still, um, but we don't have quotas. Never will. Um, in our arrest last year, um, we had 5,250 arrests, and what that's a lot. That was an increase of almost 30% uh, over 2013. Um, I think part of the reason for that can be explained by our push to clear a backlog of war arrest warrants that we had. Um, so I, I don't know what our numbers are so far this year, um, but I don't know that we'll, we'll hit that. That's, that's a bunch of, bunch of arrests. So, um, so how do we compare or stack up uh, to what's going on across the country? And I told you a little bit about our crime figures, um, a little bit about who we are. Well, how, how do we look in terms of what's going on in communities like Ferguson, Missouri, or, uh, or Baltimore? You know, pick, pick the hot spot out there. Um, so I try to back up my anecdotal information with figures and you know, give you something um, that, that, that shows you that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so we. Anytime a complaint is filed on a police officer, um, we conduct either an internal affairs investigation or an administrative review. In addition, um, if my, one of my supervisors sees one of our officers or catches an officer doing something that's not quite right, we can also open up an investigation at that point. If they have a crash, we open up an investigation. Um, if they use force, we open an investigation. Um, even if they pull their gun out of the holster and point it at somebody, we consider that a use of force and we track that. So we have very, very rigid, very strict use of force reporting standards. And I think that keeps us out of trouble because we know what our officers are doing out there on the street, whereas uh, agencies across the country and even locally don't track use of force at all. Uh, they don't do it. Every time we have a use of force, it starts a review process with that officer's supervisor and it ends on my desk. And I see every single one of them and I read them and I review them and we make recommendations for change if needed, whether it's policy change or the officer needs to change his response to a typical or a, you know, a, a resistance 
uh, encounter him because he's dealing with somebody. But last year, so that's all that's all encompassing. Uh, that's everything that we would consider an internal investigation or administrative review. So last year, in 2014, we had 141 internal affairs investigations or uh, administrative reviews. Now that sounds like an awful lot, right? And I saw that number and I was like, holy cow, that's got to be high. But it was a drop in 2013. But the number that I think is really important out of all that is that only eight of those 141 complaints were generated from outside the police department. That means 133 times supervisors at the Rogers Police Department saw something that they felt like needed a little further investigation, so they, they got assigned to our professional standards office, and we looked at it, and we decided whether or not that officer was out of line or had broken a policy or broken you know, our past practices. So I was very happy to see that. I think that's a, that's a compliment to the supervisors at the police department that they are paying attention, they're watching their officers, that they know what's going on. Um, so out of that 141, we had 72 uh, use of force incidents. However, 25 of those were when officers discharged their weapon to humanely destroy an animal. Um, a deer gets struck by a car. Um, we, we had a lot of those last year. So if you take that away, there's only 48 times out of 5,000 arrests in 2014 that our officers could not talk somebody into peaceably going with them. And I think that is tremendous. That is just out of this world. I was in Boston this summer uh, discussing uh, some stuff with other police leaders across the country. I talked to a Los Angeles Police Department captain who is in charge of one of the busiest divisions out there. Had 450 officers just as a captain that were assigned to him. I, should, I told him about that number and he didn't believe me. He thought there's absolutely no way it could be done. And I said I got the paperwork approved, and I emailed it to him when I got when I got home, when I got back to Rogers. Um, so that's, that that tells me, as a chief, that our officers have very good de-escalation skills. That's been a big buzzword in law enforcement over the last six months: de-escalation. If we're using force 48 times to put handcuffs on 5,000 people, um, we're doing it right. Uh, I'm very proud of the men and women of the Rogers Police Department for that. Um, Another thing, and I'm, I'm babbling and I'm running out of time, so I'll give you some other big numbers here. Um, they talk a lot about racial disparity uh, across the country. And, you know, you point to Ferguson, and I think they were 60-ish percent African-American, but like 90 percent of law enforcement contacts involved African-American citizens up there. Well, Chief Rogers has a bunch of Latinos that live in the city. We sure do. According to the 2010 uh, census, we're about 31% of our Latino, our Latinos uh, throughout the city. And in 2014, 21% of our entire traffic stops involved Latino drivers. So we're 10% below the average. It's a good number, it's a good number to be at. Um, where's our problems? Well, it's a racial makeup of our workforce. Um, my good friend Jose has been trying to help me for years on that. Um, we don't have enough uh, Latino officers, I don't have enough African American officers, and I don't know how to get them. Um, Jose's helped. Uh, there's a group of us that meet uh, with minority leaders throughout our community, um, but it, it's tough. Uh, it's tough to recruit to uh, the police department. You know, I think this last year has made it harder for us to recruit. Um, but. Every other law enforcement agency in Northwest Arkansas is also looking for those minority candidates. You know, and I've, I've talked to some, and I've told them, you know, keep your nose clean, you can write your ticket. You know, you can go where you want to go, pick the agency you want to work for, because you, they are very, very valuable uh, to us, the language skills. Um, and then, you know, the fact that we adequately reflect the makeup of our community, that, that is important, I think, to uh, our community as a whole, but I think it's even more important to our minority community who wants to feel like they belong. And that, I think if I've learned anything in dealing with uh, uh, the, the minority leadership group that we have, is uh, they care just as much about our community uh, as I do, as you do, and they want to be involved and they want to help. Uh, and well, we've had some great great opportunities to, to interact with them. Um, so real quickly, before I open this up for questions, um, 
some challenges that we face going forward. Uh, first and foremost is recruiting and retention. Um, we have a very hard time filling vacancies at the police department. Um, it seems like every young person that's eligible age-wise, citizenship-wise, education-wise, uh, has a drug problem. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of our candidates uh, get washed out of the process for drugs. Uh, a lot of them have a problem with the, the truth. Um, before you work at the Rogers Police Department, we hook you up to a lie detector test and you've got to pass. Um, and it's, it's a pretty in-depth process, but there's a lot of people that have trouble uh, getting past that. So re the recruiting of, of police officers is uh, a challenge. And again, not just to Rogers, that's across the country. You can talk to any chief in Northwest Arkansas, they face a lot of the same problems uh, that we do. Uh, and then, um, again, just our public perception. Um, having, uh, you know, a reputation of being a community partner and a community player and here for the right reasons. Um, there's a lot of talk going on in the national law enforcement media about this uh, warrior mindset. That have we poisoned our officers, you know, into thinking that uh, they have to be warriors out on the street? And what does that do, you know, for generations of officers who have come up under that? Should we be taking on a guardian role? Um, which I think is probably where you're seeing law enforcement transition to in the next five to ten years. Um, so my vision, my hope for the police department is that we can still go out and take care of business. We can still go out and kick a little butt and take some names when we need to. But I challenge our police officers to be as nice as you can to everybody you deal with until it's time not to be nice again anymore because it's something that they've done. Don't be the one to ramp up the situation. So. Um, I think they've done a good job of that. It's a work in progress. Um, it's something that we're going to continue to work on and continue to try to do to be a good community partner. Um, and, and opportunities like this um, come around every so often, and it's a good opportunity for me to let you know uh, what we are doing out there in the community to try and make it a safe place for everybody. So uh, with that, I'm sorry I've gone way over <coughs> what I'm supposed to. Uh, but if anybody had any questions, I've got about 10 minutes, and then I'm Got to run. And then again, um, my, my business cards are up there. It has my phone number and email. If you ever need anything from me, please grab it. Yes, ma'am. How many women? Oh, you got me on that one. I didn't bring that up either. <laughs> okay. uh, sworn officers, we have three female police officers. Or, uh, yeah, three. We just lost one. Um, but our dispatch, there's 20, uh, 26 ish dispatchers and maybe three or four males. Uh, our records division uh, accounts for probably about 15, and uh, there's three men that work down there. So we, we're very heavily female on the non sworn side, the civilian side, uh, but on the uh, sworn side, we can do better. That's another place where we need to improve. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned about accidents before. <coughs> you said private property you did not report. Right. Like semi parking lots. Right. If I have an accident in any If uh, so, the question was, what happens since we don't take a report of a crash in a parking lot? Uh, the exception is we will take a report if it's a hit and run. If you're at the grocery store, you come out and the back of your car has been sideswiped um, and they've driven off, we will take a report on that. Or if there's an injury, uh, we'll take a report on that. But what I would encourage everybody to do, if you have an accident on private property involving another vehicle, is to make sure and contact us. Because what we will do is we will show up and we'll deal with both drivers and make sure everybody has insurance. And then we'll give each driver a form um, that will have your name, insurance, company, and stuff like that. The main stuff that you would supply anyway. Um, and you'll get the other drivers and the other driver will get yours. And then you can just take that straight to your insurance company and get your car fixed. So there's a little bit of documentation, but it's not a full-blown state accident. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We've heard a lot nationally about police departments uh, taking surplus military equipment. Has Rogers been involved in that program? We have. Um, uh, I wish my friend from the media was not here. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yes, we have. Uh, we have an MRAP. Um, which been reported. Um, it's just not uh, front page news. We've got one of those giant six wheel super thick glass bullet resistant bomb resistant vehicles. Uh, we have it. 
Why do you have that um, as a rescue vehicle? That is not you know, an assault vehicle. That is a rescue vehicle. Uh, it's in the process of going through some uh, uh, rehabbing uh, from its use overseas by our military. Um, it is painted white. It's not gonna be black, it's, you know, it's white, it's gonna say rescue on it. Um, but it is assigned to our tactical unit, our SWAT team. Um, that, to me, is a piece of equipment that I hope we never, ever need. But if we need it, there's no substitute. We've gotta have it, we've gotta have it quick. Um, it was at little to no cost to the taxpayers. Um, I felt like at the time we got it, it was a good idea. Um, that's obviously come under a lot of scrutiny right now. Um, but I think that um, it's being blown out of proportion by the media a little bit as far as the militarization. You know, they're referred to as tanks. You know, there's not a law enforcement agency in the country that has a true tank, you know, with a big, huge cannon on the front of it. Um, those MRAPs, they look like tanks. They're big. Um, but, uh, you know, it serves as a rescue purpose for the Rocher Police Department. And that's all we have. We have no other federal uh, surplus property. We don't have any firearms. Um, gosh, I can't think of it. I mean, a lot of the things that uh, were, were kind of criticized uh, dealt with aircraft, weapons, uh, like Humvees and stuff like that. Uh, we have, we've had opportunities to get Humvees in the past, but you know, I kind of looked at that like, well, what would I use it for? You know, so that's all we got. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Prevalency of gangs in Dodgers. What could you share with us regarding that issue? Well, um, I've said for years, and I've sat in this building back before the big remodel in the <clears throat> late 90s and said, um, Are there gangs in Rogers? Yes, absolutely they are. They have been probably since before I came to work in, in 1994. Um, do we have a gang problem in Rogers? Well, what does a gang problem look like? To me, a gang problem looks like a bunch of drive-by shootings, a lot of graffiti incidents, street corner drug sales, uh, maybe even open air prostitution. Do we have any of that? No, we don't. We've got a little bit of graffiti that goes on uh, throughout the city. Um, we're aware of the gang presence in Rogers in Northwest Arkansas, and we keep an eye on it. We work very closely with other agencies across the, the county and Washington County to keep an eye on that. Um, you know, what's going on in Springdale, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what will never happen in Rogers. Um, you know, it's a five minute car ride away. Um, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, I think a lot about, our officers think a lot about. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to comment on what Springdale's doing because I don't know the ins and outs of everything that's going on down there. I know I've talked to their chief, um, they're, you know, they're throwing a lot of resources at it as well. Um, and, uh, you know, but it won't, I'm not gonna sit here and try to, you know, sell you a story that's never gonna happen at Rogers. Um, you know, it's happened before, it's likely to happen again. Um, but the thing that we're seeing about this is again, it's not random violence. These are all individuals who've been on law enforcement's radar, they're known to us and they're known to each other. You know, they're not targeting from everything I've seen, they're not targeting random citizens in our community. Um, this is subtle and old scores, to the best of my knowledge. So, um, but I tell you, you know, you're, it's not something that I think the average citizen should worry about. It's not something you should spend time worrying about. Um, I think you should spend time worrying about making sure your car door is locked, and locking, <laughs> locking your house door before you go away. Little things like that. So. Anybody else? How about funeral escorts? Still doing. We are. Springdale, they uh, they taught us a heck of a lesson when they decided they weren't going to do funeral escorts anymore. Our chief Allen was the chief at the time, and he said, nope, we're going to do them. So we still do them. Yep, still do them. So I think that's a good, that's a good uh, um, service we can provide the community as long as our calls for service load are such that we can still do that without taking away from more priority calls. Um, we'll, we'll continue to do that. So. Well, thank you. Chief Minor, big. Yeah. <laughs>
for the opportunity again. It's important for uh, for you to know the police department, for you to feel comfortable dealing with us at the police department. Uh, my business cards are over there. I'll leave them as I run out the door to my next appointment. But uh, please don't ever hesitate to contact me or anybody at our agency that, that, that can help you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.